Okay, hello. Um, so, unless there are any questions, um, I hope it was clear in the end. I got one question over email whether we're act, whether we're actually going back to in person next week. And again, the answer is assuming. I haven't checked my email for a while. Assuming the school hasn't changed its mind about it, um, or doesn't change its mind about it, the answer is yes. Meaning, I will be back there lecturing in person. Uh, but as I kept saying last time, if you don't want to go back in person, you can still join via Zoom. Um, OK. Uh, all right, so I'm just going to start talking about Goodman, Nelson Goodman. Uh, I should have written down his dates in there. But... Oh, well. Um, uh, with this reading, so, um, so this book was actually first published in 1953. Um, but actually, Carnap first uh, responded to a version of the arguments, of Goodman's argument in 1947. So actually, you know, we've gone back in time from last time, right? Because remember, the methodological character was written in 1956, uh, or published in 1956. Um, uh, Nevertheless, I feel like this comes after the issue between Putnam and Carnap. I feel, well, I don't know, why do I think that? I mean, it's similar to the reason I've put Putnam before Kuhn uh, in the second half of the course. I'm not sure I can really explain why I feel that way. But um, anyway, I do feel like this is a more fundamental, it's, I mean, how could it be more fundamental than Putnam? Putnam just dismisses Carnap's whole project as um, that like there's no problem to solve, whereas I'm about to say that's not true with Goodman. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just wrong. Maybe I sh we should read Putnam at the end of the course. <laughs> anyway, be that as it may, um, um, you well actually. So if you have the physical book, um, but I guess most of you don't. But if you have the physical book, you'll see that it actually has an introduction or foreword written by Putnam in 1983. The fourth edition came with a foreword by Hillary Putnam. Um, that Putnam is somewhat different than the 1962 Putnam, <laughs> um, but uh, it's uh, kind of interesting. Um, by the way, if for some reason you want to see the physical book, I believe it's on reserve at McHenry, um, which last I hold, heard is completely open. Um, Okay, anyway, so uh, that's, I guess, as much as I'm going to say about the historical, well, no, I'm going to say a couple more things as I go along, but it's most of what I'm going to say about the historical context. Um, uh, in terms of the content here, so I think reading it, you, it may at first, I'm not sure if you get this impression or not, but I think it may at first seem as if the subject has completely changed. And also, Goodman sounds so different than Putnam. I'm sorry, than uh, Carnap. That uh, it may be hard to see that um, there's two, these are two parts of the same story. But actually, I mean, first of all, broadly speaking, we're still worrying about what makes concepts legitimate. 
Um, I guess that will be clearer in next week's reading, what kind of problem Goodman is raising from that, but he, for that, but he starts right away by saying, you know, um, the question is like, uh, what concepts, what kinds of terms do we want to allow and what kind of terms do we not want to allow? And uh, how can we show in questionable cases that they're allowable, basically, or acceptable, as he says. Um, and, um, you know, which con what concepts are legitimate in modern science? And... I mean, it's, I think it's clear that as in Carnap, he's especially interested in the use of concepts in science and what we would normally call science, but also that he doesn't make a really strong distinction between that and everyday common sense use of concepts. Um, So, uh, yeah, the big, the big new problem that Goodman is going to talk about isn't going to come out until the second reading, um, right? It's what he calls the new riddle of induction. Um, and so, like, roughly speaking, the new riddle of induction is about um, why, if you have a sentence like, this piece of copper electricity um, this is evidence for so of course it doesn't guarantee it doesn't in any way guarantee the truth but um, it helps establish the truth at least this is what you think if you believe in induction at all of this statement, all copper conducts electricity. So, uh, you know, that is the process of induction is supposed to consist in uh, verifying this kind of universal statement by going out and checking its instances and we try we hope to find lots of positive instances and no negative ones so we hope that every time we test a piece of copper that they all conduct electricity and we conclude with greater and greater certainty or something that all copper conducts electricity so that's fine but what about this sentence um, this thing on my desk conducts electricity. This is not evidence that everything on my desk conducts electricity. Now, I mean, I guess you might think, well, if there's only a finite number of things on your desk, then it does raise the probability that everything on your desk conducts electricity, right? Because now we know one of them does. <laughs> but, um, but like to understand what it would mean for this to be evidence for that universal statement, you have to imagine like that I bring something else that doesn't conduct electricity and put it on my desk. Now is it going to start conducting electricity because it's on my desk? 
So this is not evidence for that. In fact, it's really not clear that we could collect evidence for that. Right? That is, there seems to be something wrong with um, the conclusion we're trying to draw. In, in particular, there seems to be something wrong maybe with the concept we're trying to use. Thing on my desk. Right? Things on my desk are not um, a kind of things. But the problem is, you know, thing on my desk is, is like, if by thing you mean body, let's say, right? Like sensible body on my desk. Uh, those seem like perfectly good observable concepts, right? I mean, it seems just like Carna the, Car the examples that Carnap and Neurath discuss about there's a red sphere on the table and so on and so forth, right? Um, so uh, what could be wrong with the concept thing on my desk? So, I mean, so like roughly speaking, the new riddle of induction is about this. And the first part of the book is um, like building up to it. Um, but, but I hope you can understand why this is like, this is a problem for Carnap. Right? Like Carnap wants to say that, 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 start with things that we evidently have a right to say, like there's a thing on this desk. Um, and um, make your concepts based on stuff like that, and you'll have all legitimate concepts, and then you can use the concepts to make statements for which you can, ca you can gather empirical evidence. That's what I keep saying is the point of Carnap's project, but, but this seems to be a counterexample to that. It seems like you need some other criterion for saying which concepts are acceptable and which are not. Or that is, which can be used in inductively verifiable statements and which can't. <laughs> we have some other, uh, okay, please stop. How are you gonna get out of there? <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, all right. So he's building up to that, but he doesn't start straight in by talking about that. Um, and um, the reason is because well, I don't know. Maybe I can't explain the reason. Maybe I just have to go through it, and then we'll we'll see how it connects. So, I mean, so, so that problem is a problem for Carnap. And that's why Goodman is in this half of the course. Goodman is, is raising a problem for the kind of project that Carnap has, which is a project of showing that uh, science is legitimate because it uses legitimate concepts. And legitimate concepts are empirical, empirically meaningful concepts. But, um, of course, the connection to Carnap goes beyond that. Um, there's also a lot of details in which Goodman is similar to Carnap. And uh, it's actually not a coincidence at all. Goodman uh, is um, um, heavily engaged with Carnap. He's, in 1951, he published a bigger book called The Structure of Appearance, which uh, the point of the structure of, of, of appearance is pretty explicitly to, to, to do what Carnap was trying to do in the Aufbau, but to do it better. Right? So, so, so Goodman talks in that book a lot about, like, uh, you know, what he thinks Carnap is trying to do, and then uh, you know gives his own proposals for fixing things up. Um, 
so as I said, it's not surprising that there's a lot of um, close connections between what Goodman is trying to do here and what Carnap was trying to do. Um, so for example, like on page 31, Goodman says that the project of philosophy is explanation, or on page 47, he calls it explication. Um, and I guess that many, um, if not all, Anna, please don't. Okay, go. Um, <laughs> Tyler's crawling around here. All right. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so I think many, although not all, analytic philosophers would still agree that, that this is the project or part of the project of philosophy. And it's basically what Carnap calls rational reconstruction. Um, science and common sense are going to have to be, for the most part, respected. We want to get the um, things that people say to uh, actually mean something according to us. <laughs> um, and that's kind of a test of whether we're doing it properly. Right, so that's so, I mean, that has something to do with what people nowadays call intuitions, you know, when they're trying to figure out what some term like good means or, um, you know, whether some, philosophical theory is um, is a good theory or not, they'll like say, well, it doesn't seem that in this case we would say, my intuition is that we wouldn't say that. And intuition there means kind of like um, some guess at what ordinary people would say before they start on philosophical theorizing, something like that. Uh, it's actually, I don't think it's very well defined the way people use it and have been using it for a while, but it's, it's something like that. And, you know, so the, the project is to get a philosophical theory that respects our intuitions. That is, that allows us to keep saying the things we would usually say. Um, and in particular, but I mean, but Goodman, I think, is even closer to Carnap than just that vague characterization. He's going to say um, in the next reading explicitly that um, what has to be preserved is the extension of ordinary and scientific predicates, right? So if we take a term like flexible, So flexible is um, one of the terms that Goodman spends a long time discussing how to explain or explicate, or as Carnap would say, rationally reconstruct. And, um, and the criterion of success here is not that when we, I mean, so what we're, as in Carnap, we're gonna try to do this by defining flexible. We're going to try to um, get better terms in some sense and define flexible in terms of those and thereby get rid of the troublesome predicate flexible by saying it's equivalent to this definition. But for the definition to be successful, what's required is not that everyone will say, oh yeah, that's what I mean by flexible. What's required is just that whatever our definition is, it has to apply to exactly the same objects that flexible does, right? So, you know, like our definition of flexible is going to be, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the point is that 
Right, flexible is a concept, a propositional function. You supply an object to it and it gives you a proposition. And this proposition is either true or false. And our definition is going to be successful. Our definition is going to be some more complicated propositional function. Give it the same object. It will give you some other proposition. And the criterion of success is that this proposition is true if and only if that one is. Right? So this propositional function gives you a true proposition when this one does and a false proposition when this one does. Or, as Carnap would say, in the material mode, exactly the same things are, they, like call this blah, blah, blah. Exactly the same things are blah, blah, blah as are flexible. Something is blah, blah, blah if and only if it's flexible. And at that point, we're going to count the definition as a success. So like, for example, if you, you know, define human being as a featherless biped with uh, broad toenails, <laughs> um, you have to add the broad toenails to rule out the plucked chicken counterexample. So uh, if you define human as a featherless biped with broad toenails, then um, the definition is successful if and only if, or the definition is successful if um, all the things we call humans are also featherless bipeds with broad toenails. And if you say, but that may be true, but that's not what I mean by human, that is not relevant. So in other words, we're trying to, we're, we're still tr doing rational construction in Carnap's sense of trying to preserve what he calls the logical meaning. Um, and that's going to be important because uh, I think one of the things that's hard to understand about what Goodman says about flexible, um, or that students find hard to understand about it is that, um, Yeah, he seems to entertain proposals for defining flexible that have nothing to do with what flexible actually means. Um, and the reason for that, again, is that um, we don't want it to have the same content as our concept flexible, whatever that is. right? That thing that Carnap describes as just associations we have with the word. We don't want it to have that. We just want it to to we just want to be sure that if you replace flexible with the definition that we're giving, you won't make any sentences change from true to false or false to true. Okay, so um, Christopher asks, we can't use flexible because it's indeterminate. No, that's not why. Um, but I'm, I'm about to start explaining why we can't use it, as well as Goodman explains it, which is not, by his own confession, is not really that compelling an explanation. Um, so, um, right, so the, um, so this project, I think it does, I mean, to even start on this project, a project like this of rational reconstruction, you do have to feel that there was something wrong with just continuing to use flexible, right? Like why do we need a definition of flexible in terms of other things? Flexible means flexible. Everyone knows what it means, right? As Putnam would say, is there something unclear about the meaning? Do people require paraphrases when you say it, you know? Um, so, um, but according to Goodman, there is something wrong with certain predicates. 
He calls them inacceptable predicates. And so the project of rational reconstruction or explication in this, and inacceptable is short for, this is probably important to remember, inacceptable is really short for inacceptable without explanation. Ray, that is, um, Again, Goodman is not out to like tell people they they should stop calling things flexible. On the contrary, he wants to show why it is acceptable for them to call things flexible. But in order to show that, he has to provide an explanation because flexible is a kind. And again, I haven't said why yet. <laughs> but. I'm just talking about the inacceptable, acceptable distinction in the abstract here, right? So I'm not saying why flexible is on the wrong side of it. But the point is, like, if you accept that flexible is inacceptable without explanation, then the fact that we're all going around saying flexible is, uh, like, philosophically scandalous. We're all saying something that's inacceptable without explanation, but we don't have an explanation. And so the project of rational reconstruction is, pro is provide the explanation. And the explanation is, you know, again, takes the form of reducing, eliminating, somehow like getting rid of the term flexible in our sentences in favor of sentences that only contain what? Well, that only contain acceptable terms. Now, by the way, I don't know why he says inacceptable rather than unacceptable. Um, um, I actually this year finally got around to looking up inacceptable in the OED. Um, people have been saying inacceptable for a long time. Like the, I think their first uh, evidence was from the 16th century, but uh, unacceptable has always been more common and unacceptable was used earlier. So inacceptable is kind of a weird word. Um, um, it's possible that he's just being pedantic. I mean, you know, since this part is Latin, you know, maybe he's thinking that strictly speaking, you should use a Latin prefix rather than the Germanic prefix un. But seriously, we don't follow that rule in English. I, you know, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, I mean, he is a little finicky that way, right? Like the way he keeps saying inflammable, where we would mostly say flammable. <laughs> um, uh, but so I, for, for other reasons, obviously, not for this one. Um, but um, anyway, so I, I'm not sure. I am going to suggest later maybe there's another reason why he wants to say unacceptable. But... Um, um, be that as it may, um, the important thing to notice is about this inacceptable, acceptable distinction is that it's somehow going to replace verificationism. Right? He says this explicitly in, uh, on page 31, note 1. Well, actually, on the text and the note. Um, and here's the text. Yet I am afraid that we are nowhere near having any sound general principle for drawing this line. The line is the acceptable, inacceptable line. That's what he's talking about. We're nowhere near having a sound general principle for drawing this line. 
surely I need not in this place and before this audience, this was, these were originally lectures, that's why I said that, I need not in this place and before this audience recount the tragic history of the verification theory of meaning. And then he has a footnote about Ayer and Hempel and whatever. Um, in other words, the, and at least as Goodman understands it, the verification theory of meaning was an attempt at a general principle for drawing this distinction. And the general principle was supposed to be that a term is acceptable if it like refers directly to the given or whatever, something like that, you know, contains only directly observable properties. And uh, a term, any other term was unacceptable without explanation. And the explanation would take the form of um, reduction in the sense of the aufbau, which is supposed to be a definition that of some kind that allows you to eliminate the unacceptable term. So, um, right, he calls that history tragic. I take it that, you know, um, again, assuming he's being kind of pedantic and classical, right? A, a, a tragedy is no good unless the uh, tragic character is noble, right? I mean, um, a tragedy is not just about something bad that happened to someone. It has to be someone noble, but they have to have a tragic flaw and whatever. So I think in calling it tragic, he's saying that um, this was a worthy project, but unfortunately it doesn't work. So uh, we don't have a general principle. Um, but we're still basically trying to do the same thing. So, I mean, I can kind of see about flexible, you know, you can't necessarily tell just from looking at something whether it's flexible. Um, so, uh, but moreover, if you paid attention to, I didn't talk about this very much, but about what Carnap says in the methodological status theory, you'll know that disposition terms um, were already considered a problem for um, verificationism or for its descendants before Goodman started talking about it. So, you know, and again, it's because, like, you can't tell necessarily by looking at something whether it's flexible. If it's under suitable pressure, so by pressure, I guess he means, like, um, Like bending force, like strain or something, right? I mean, he doesn't, but anyway, if it's under suitable pressure, um, then you can tell by looking at it whether it's flexible, because if it's flexible and it's under suitable pressure, then you'll see it bending. Um, if you see it under suitable pressure and it's bending, then you know it's flexible. But if you see it under suitable pressure and it's not bending, then you know it's not flexible. So, um, but what if it's not under suitable pressure? What if it's just sitting there? Or what if it's under extreme pressure? Right? The suitable pressure has limits in both directions, I think. So if it's not under much pressure at all, or it's under extreme pressure, then you can't tell by looking at it whether it's flexible. Because if it's under no pressure at all, then it won't be bending, whether it's flexible or not. Or at least it might not be bending. I leave out a question of whether something's 
bend by themselves without any pressure or whatever. But anyway, let's say it won't be bending even if it's flexible. And of course, if it's under extreme pressure, it might be bending even though it's not flexible. Um, that is, even though we wouldn't ordinarily call it flexible. So like a steel beam will bend if you put it under enough pressure, but we wouldn't call a steel beam flexible. It's rigid. At least in most contexts, we wouldn't. Um, if we're deciding whether to build a bridge out of steel or out of stone, we might say steel is better because it's flexible in an earthquake or something like that, right? But so, I mean, um, we wouldn't ordinarily just straight out say that a steel beam is flexible. Now, so, I mean, I think that issue that I was just getting at about flexible is maybe what Christopher meant when he said, like, is it because it's indeterminate? Like, meaning vague, I guess. It, cause, so the answer is yes, the term flexible is, is somewhat vague or, and or its meaning depends on context. Um, um, but um, Goodman doesn't want a definition that, of, that eliminates that vagueness. That is not the problem. The vagueness is not the problem. On the contrary, Goodman wants a def. If the term, the way we ordinarily use it, is vague or depends on context, then Goodman wants his definition to do the same thing. He wants his definition to be vague or depend on context in the same way. So, like for example, if you could define flexible as is bending under suitable pressure. then um, that would satisfy him. And because the, the vagueness that was in the term flexible has been transferred to the term suitable, and it's still the exact same vagueness and, or dependence on context. I keep saying both of those things because they're not exactly the same, but they somehow go together. Anyway, um, the, um, the vagueness or context dependence in the meaning of flexible is is captured by the similarly vague or context dependent term suitable and so the definition is good whereas if we were to, if i were to you know try to define flexible as you know is bending under exactly so and so many uh, you know newtons of force or whatever then um, um, that would actually be a bad definition because it would be more precise than the thing we're trying to define, and so it wouldn't define it accurately. It wouldn't preserve the logical meaning. Right? Like, because when I say in the right context that a steel beam is flexible, that should come out true. Whereas that precise definition would make it false. Is that, I mean, this is kind of a side issue, but I know from experience, in fact, I wrote a note to myself last year, <laughs> I, or last time I taught this course, which was 2020, I guess. But anyway, I, you know, I wrote a note to myself, like, um, that I know that people often get confused and think that the problem with flexible is the vagueness, but that is, that's not the problem. The problem is, like I said, you know, okay, try defining it as bending under suitable pressure. That's just not going to work because lots of things are flexible, even though they're not under suitable pressure. Okay, are there more questions about that? I can't even see because I'm not looking at the chat. No, there's no more questions in the chat. Anyway. Color register. All right. Um,
Okay, so um, so uh, like I'm going on with the comparison to Carnap. So we have this desire to eliminate certain terms by definition in favor of other terms. And Goodman says that he's trying to capture the same distinction, roughly speaking, that the um, Vienna Circle people were trying to capture with the verification theory of meaning. And the actual example he spends most of his time on is one that they also found very problematic. Um, but there's also another thing which in this book is underplayed, although like I said in 1951 it was clear how interested Goodman was in that, namely that um, this is going to be done in the context of a system that we're trying to set up. It's not just a case-by-case -case thing where someone throws an unacceptable term at you and you say, hmm, how can I explain that? We want, uh, we want a whole system. Um, so, um, sometimes he also calls it a language. Um, and moreover, he even says this, that the distinction between um, acceptable and, unac and unacceptable is going to depend on our choice of a system form. Right, so this is the fo a footnote on page 41. Now, um, I guess before reading it, so on page 41, he's talking about, um, like I said, flexible is an example of a disposition term. There are many, many examples of disposition terms, but you know, I mean, so uh, like flammable or, uh, um, conducts electricity is a disposition term, right? Because the copper is still a conductor of electricity even if when there's no current going through it. It means that like if I were to apply a voltage difference across the two ends of the piece of pop copper, a current would flow. If I were to put suitable pressure on the thing, it would bend. Um, right, that's so that's what dispositional terms are like, and in this, and the opposite of dispositional terms, so 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 disposition term is like is not terminology that now that Goodman is making up, right? That's what people have been calling these things as they worry over them. Um, I guess uh, in some sense, since Aristotle, uh, but. Uh, I mean, subject to translation traditions, but anyway, um, certainly the Vienna Circle people were all using this terminology of disposition term, but um, this, I believe, is Goodman's invention, as far as I know, that the opposite of a disposition term, a term that's not about a disposition, he calls a manifest term. So this is just technical. Right, like you just have to realize that whenever he says manifest term, he means not a disposition term. And in footnote 41, he's, what he's worried, I mean, sorry, on footnote one on page 41, what he's worried about is whether we know how to draw the line between disposition terms and manifest terms, and whether we know any clear examples of manifest terms at all, right? So he says, um, I have no illusion that this constitutes an adequate definition of the distinction, what he said in the text that is, of the distinction between dispositional and manifest predicates. Indeed, this distinction, like that between primitive and defined terms, may be a purely relative one. So, um, I mean, 
first of all, the idea that the distinction between primitive and defined terms is relative is just exactly the same thing that Carnap expresses by saying the distinction between objects and quasi-objects is relative. And it's relative to the same thing. It's relative to the choice of system form. So as Goodman says, goes on, a predicate like bends, for example, or I would say is bending. I'll talk about that in a second. But anyway, a predicate like bends, for example, may be dispositional under a phenomenalistic system. So what's a phenomenalistic system? It means basically what Carnap calls an auto-psychological system, or maybe a just a psychological system, generally speaking. Right? If we take as the basis of the system dis you know, descriptions of how things appear to me or how they appear to people in general, um, then like when I say such and such a thing is bending, that's going to, I'm going to think of that as a dispositional term. It means if someone were looking at it, they would see something bending. But on the other hand, if we take a physical basis, then um, is bending will be a manifest predicate. Right? It describes what the physical system is actually doing. So he's saying that, uh, you know, that distinction between dispositional and manifest is relative to choice of system. And that shows two things. Number one, that he is thinking of choosing a system. Um, and among similar alternatives to the one Carnap is thinking about, and that he thinks that the acceptable, unacceptable distinction may change depending on what system we choose. Sorry, acceptable, unacceptable distinction may change based on what system we choose. Right? And he says, actually, towards the bottom of that footnote, um, the particular distinction drawn in the above text is thus perhaps best regarded as one chosen for the purpose of illustrating in a convenient and natural way the general problem of construing dispositional predicates on the basis of whatever predicates may be chosen as manifest. Um, okay, so I mean all of that shows that Goodman is actually pretty close to Carnap, much more so than Quine, I think we'll see, even though Goodman and Quine had um, similar interests in, for example, uh, trying to eliminate talk about classes um, that ultimately, you know, they they don't agree with each other, and Goodman, as I said, is much closer to Carnap than Quine is. Um, okay, on the other hand, like, um, So like um, so that's all like what hasn't changed or in ways in which Goodman is is still pretty similar to Carnap. On the other hand, something big has changed, and um, so um, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about what Carnap and the other positivists, logical positivists, proposed to do at first with disposition terms. This is especially in Carnap's paper, Testability and Meanings, which is from 1936. So we didn't read that. That's a stage in between stages of Carnap that we read. Um, but uh, so, and that's kind of the height of Carnap's interest in disposition terms, I think. Um, and what he proposes, what Carnap proposes to do is this. So like 
We have our um, disposition term, call it Q sub D. So in this case, Q sub D is flexible. And we want to say, we want, what we first think of doing is to define um, our disposition term using the kind of like uh, correlative manifest predicate, the one that goes along with it, which in this case would be is bending. Now, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is as good a time as any to stop and discuss this issue of the, like, so what Goodman would say, would call this predicate bends. When he says, though, that something bends, he means it bends at some time, present, past, or future, some specific time. Um, and, well, that's just not the right way to say it in English. Right? I mean, that's not what we use the simple present for, except sometimes philosophers do. So it's a use, a timeless use of the simple present where, you know, you mean you're interested in an event that happens at a particular time, but you don't care when the time is. So, um, um, but I mean, normally we use the simple present for other things. The main thing we use it for is um, for, well, I mean, there's a couple things we use it for. I guess the most important one is we use it for like, you know, usual or habitual action, right? So if we say, you know, this thing bends, we mean that um, there are times in the past and the future when it, you know, there's times in the past when it has bent and there are times in the future when it will bend. It's like a normal thing for it to bend, right? Like if I say, you know, I drive to the store I, as a put, you know, I don't walk to the store. I drive to the store. I'm not talking about a specific time that happened. Sometimes we also use it even to indicate dispositionality, right? Like if we say, you know, um, trying to think of a good example of this. But if you say that bends, you can mean something like that will bend. You can get that to bend. <laughs> right? Let me say that works maybe is an example of that. So for all those reasons, now, so I think for all those reasons, what we could should call this predicate is something like was bending, is bending, or will be bending. <laughs> But for short, I'm just going to say is bending. Because that's what we use to talk about a particular event. And that's what he's interested in. And, you know, I wish I could go back and change Goodman's text. <laughs> because I think this is very confusing. Um, right? Like even, I, I, you know, Actually, here's a better example of how we use it to mean dispositionality. When I say copper conducts electricity, I mean copper has a disposition to conduct electricity, as opposed to this piece of copper is conducting electricity, <laughs> right? So, um, right. So this predicate, so when we say Q of X, we mean that X is actually doing the thing. And so we wanted to define, you know, the dispositional term as, or, or at least at some time, that is, that's right, she really should say X was doing it, or X is doing it, or X will do it. And we want to um, define, we think, we start off thinking, what, I said I was going to go into a little bit of detail on this, now it's stretching out. 
I'll just press forward to the end. We first we might first think of defining it like this, but it's clear it won't work, right? Because once again, there's plenty of things that aren't bending, even things that have never bent and never will bend, but that are still flexible. Right? Like if I make a piece of rubber and I keep it, you know, lying on a table for 30 years and then I destroy it, um, it may never bend in its entire existence, but it was flexible. I just didn't try to bend it, right? So, um, so this definition is no good. These two things are not equivalent to each other. So you have to somehow add in the um, the conditions, and I guess you know. So. So you might first think of it doing it like this. Again, this means and. You like it better if you write this way. I can't really make an ampersand. <laughs> I like this way. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, like, or, no, sorry. Right? It's under suitable pressure and it's bending is the same as it's flexible. But that's still no good because, you know, actually, I mean, the examples I was just giving speak more, speak to this one more than the other one that, you know, uh, the thing, maybe the thing is never put under suitable pressure and it never bends, but it's still flexible. Um, so Carnap suggests that we introduce the dispositional term as follows. This is a C, and this means implies. Again, there's really, it's kind of weird in a way that there's no, that the people have never settled on a standard logical notation. You know, sometimes you'll see it done this way. But you know, anyway, so, right, so this says for all X, if it's under suitable pressure, then, being flexible is equivalent to bending. So it tells you that if you have something under suitable pressure and you want to know whether it's flexible or not, check to see if it's bending. But it doesn't say anything about what to do if it's not under suitable pressure. Right, because with material implication, if this is false, then the whole thing is true no matter what you put here. So if this is false, it doesn't tell you anything about what you can conclude about flexibility versus is bending. 
So Carnap, at the stage of testability and meaning, calls this a reduction sentence and says, I you know, suggest introducing dispositional predicates using reduction sentences. And so, you know, this doesn't provide an eliminative definition. It doesn't tell you how to get rid of QD in every sentence where it appears. In some sentences, you know, some statements, you know, or in some contexts, you may be able to replace QD with Q because you happen to know that the conditions will be fulfilled. But in general, if I just give you some random sentence, this piece of rubber is flexible. You can't get rid of flexible, right? Because the sentence, this, the statement out of context doesn't say whether it's under suitable pressure or not. And uh, I could only replace flexible with is bending if I know it's under suitable pressure. So that sentence can't just be translated into the piece of rubber is bending. I guess that's obvious, right? But this, this doesn't tell you any other way to replace it. So, um, I don't know if I spent too much time on that, but first of all, did people understand that? I'm sorry, it's hard to explain without introducing this, you know, without using this notation, which I'm sure not everyone is equally comfortable with. So, um, so in doing this at the stage of testability and meaning, Carnap is giving up on um, the project of reducing all um, higher level predicates to the basis in the system. Right? Remember in the Aufbau, he defined reduction as you know the process of like eliminating the higher level terms using their constructional definitions to get statements that only contain the lower level terms and eventually to get statements that only contain the fundamental concepts and relations. Um, so Angelo or Angelo or <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, you're free to tell me how to pronounce your name if you want. Um, that um, is saying, so he gives up on the system of reduction. Well, yes and no. He doesn't give up on the system, but he does give, does give up on the idea that the system works by reduction. And, you know, I mean, that shouldn't surprise you given what we saw in the methodological character paper, um, right? It's already, it's clear there, I mean, in a much stronger way that we're not going to be able to get rid of the theoretical primitives. Tragedy. Well, so, <laughs> right. Well, so from Goodman's point of view, this is a tragedy. From Carnap's point of view, as I kept pointing out, what, what Carnap wants to ensure is that we don't say things using concepts that we don't, in principle, know how to collect evidence for and against their application. Now, I mean, it's true in the Aufbau, he tried to do that by making sure that, in principle, we could tell for sure whether it applies or not. I could tell by consulting my own experience. By doing a finite number of operations on my own experiences, I could tell whether some term that I want to introduce applies or not in any case that I'm interested, or in any possible case at all, right? Um, that was the idea and the Aufbau. We already saw that there's a place where Quine is going to claim that it fails in the Aufbau, but, 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 but as, I, as I keep emphasizing, even in the Aufbau, of course, Carnap didn't think that we could actually do that, right? That I can actually use the constructional definition of, of tree in terms of the fundamental experiences, if we ever had that, which we're not close to, 
that if we had that, that I could use it to somehow, like every time before I, I said there is a tree, I could do this whole thing to verify it based on my fundamental experiences. Because the in principle part of that is based on all these fictions, right? That all my experience is already in, that I remember every individual experience and have a name for each one of them and can, you know, never forget which ones were related to which by the relations of uh, remembered similarity. Like all of that is just, you know, totally fictitious. In real life, we tell whether it's a tree by looking at it. <laughs> and uh, and that's what Carnap in that place calls intuitive. That's different from what I was, the use of intuition I was just talking about. That's what Carnap calls intuitive. We recognize it intuitively. And the project of the alpha was to show that in principle it could be rationally reconstructed. We could show that we have a right to that intuitive identification in principle. So, okay, we're giving up on that. But that was, you know, we couldn't really do that anyway. The reason we wanted to show that we could do that, again, is to show that the terms that we're introducing or that we're using are such that, you know, we can gather empirical evidence for or against their application. And this is fine for that purpose. It doesn't how you tell you how to get rid of the predicate flexible. But it shows that you mean something empirical by flexible because it says that, it, at least in certain situations, how you're going to go about telling whether something is flexible. And Carnap adds that later on, you may want to add more clauses to this if you decide that there's other ways of telling whether something is flexible. So, if you decide, meaning like you're trying to reconstruct our actual use of flexible, we, we obviously mean more than this because we apply to things that are never under suitable pressure. So you can add in other things to get the right logical meaning. Like for example, is rubber. <laughs> Right. So you can say, you know, for all x, x is flexible if x is rubber or this, you know. <laughs> um, um, and that will help. And that's fine. So, but from Goodman's point of view, this is a tragedy. Why is this a tragedy? And I think... Um, for Goodman, the point about being able to eliminate the inacceptable term. So, you know, first of all, even that terminology, calling it inacceptable, true, it means inacceptable without an explanation. But it's kind of pejorative sounding, right? It means we don't like this kind of term. As opposed to what Carnap, you know, might say, like, theoretical. We like it fine. It's just not an observation term, right? I mean, you hear the at least rhetorical difference there. So, Ray, inacceptable terms are ones you want to get rid of, if at all possible. And But why do you want to get rid of them? And... Um, So this is, he's somewhat changing the subject here, but I think you can tell from what he says, uh, you can kind of read back from what he says to what he was talking about before. Now, however, we see that to put the problem of dispositions as a problem of explaining occult properties, right? Occult means hidden in terms of manifest ones is somewhat misleading. For even the manifest properties we have illustrated are hardly to be countenanced as elements of our universe. So that's where he introduced this nominalist point that it's, you know, it's not really the properties that, that we're going to say exist, like bending. It's like the things, the concrete individuals that bend that we're going to say exist. So, um, 
But that stake, are we going to admit this as an element of our universe or not, is something that Carnap would totally reject. Right? That that could be at stake or that that even makes sense. That's like a prime example of something metaphysical. Are we going to say that there's such a thing as bending? So in the Aufbau, Carnap says, you know, well, you can construct it. So yeah, you can call it an object, or you can call it a concept. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Is it real? Well, you know, uh, if we rationally reconstruct what we mean by real, yes. <laughs> if you want to mean something more than that, that's metaphysics, right? So, like, so it shows that Goodman is. Um, and I think we'll see this in Quine also, is, is somehow the metaphysical stakes that Carnap tried to eliminate have come back. I don't think I'll be able to explain in this course fully why that's happened, but maybe I'll get something about it, especially when we talk about Quine. Okay, so all of that is the background of like, I mean, although I already introduced a lot of details about Goodman as well, but that's, you know, all that was by way of saying, you know, how does Goodman contrast to the mostly Carnap stuff we've been reading so far? How is it connected to it? And I'm saying, you know, and it's basically like, number one, he doesn't think strict verificationism will work. Well, neither does Carnap. But number two, he um, doesn't think it can be uh, it can be replaced by something that's like strict verificationism, but not as strict, which, which doesn't allow you to eliminate the terms that you're introducing. Because he says, look, if you introduce it as a primitive, you're admitting it as an element in your universe, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> So this is no good according to me. So how do we do this? Well, he, you know, he says, well, let's look at it a little bit differently. And he defines this term flexes. Now, flexes as a uh, terminological choice here has two problems. Number one, the problem I was just talking about, we should say is flexing, right? Flexes describes an event, the way Goodman introduces it. It means, I mean, really there should be a time variable It means that the conditions, that is suitable pressure, this is the object, and that's time, right? So the, the conditions hold for the object at a certain time, and The object, and again, Goodman would say the object bends at that time, but I think it's better to say the object is bending at that time. So that, right, so the, so the object is under suitable pressure at time t, and the object is bending at time t. Um, that's what it means to say that the object is flexing at time t. So that's... And I mean, again, I'm, I'm saying this not, I'm not trying to teach a, you know, lesson about um, the use of different tenses and aspects in English grammar or something. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because I know from experience how confusing it is <laughs> when people try to, students try to figure out what Goodman is talking about. So, right, so this, so when we say it is flexing, we mean it is under suitable pressure and it is bending. That's one problem with flex. The other problem with flex is that 
there's already a verb to flex, and it doesn't mean this. It means something else. So, like, I don't know what Goodman was thinking when he decided on this uh, choice. You know, so, I mean, first, like, the ordinary verb to flex is usually transitive. You flex something. Um, outside of technical, like scientific context, usually what you flex is your muscles. That's pretty much the only thing you flex in ordinary speech. But right, but it's so it's a transitive verb. It has a direct object, whereas flex, as Goodman defines it, is intransitive, like bend. Well, it's like bend could be both. That's what makes it all the more confusing. Right, so you know, bend can be used transitively, like I bend the rubber, or it can be used intransitive, transitively, like the rubber bends. The rubber is bending. It's the second one we want this to mean, right? We want to, we want this to be something a predicate that applies to the rubber. The rubber is bending. The rubber is bending something else. Ordinarily, the verb to flex can't be used that way, right? I, I can say I flex my muscles, but I can't say my muscles flex. Well, okay, it turns out, I looked this up, up in the OED also, and they say that, you know, in 1993 draft proposed changes, they point out that in America, sometimes it's used intransitively, or especially in America, and they actually give the example of, some, his muscles flexed. Okay, and moreover, nowadays there's a slang meaning of flex, which OED didn't capture, but Wiktionary came through, right? That like to, um, forget exactly how they defined it, but it means like to show off your strength or something like that, right? Um, your, your literal or metaphorical strength. None of that is what Goodman means. He should have chosen a made up word or something. So like, since I can't rewrite his whole text, all I can say is you, could, you should always remember that some, something is flexing means that it's under suitable pressure and it's bending. Other questions about that? Okay, so, um, um, right, and I'm going to say is flexing at T. So Goodman says there's something interesting about this predicate, is flexing at T. And I can show, oh no, I should have left my room somewhere. I'll go over here. I can show what's interesting about it by drawing this picture. So this picture is supposed to, the, the square is supposed to contain all actual objects. It doesn't contain possible but non-actual objects. It contains all actual objects. And I draw a circle inside the square. Now, by the way, all actual objects, so since there's a time variable here, I should have to draw a separate square for every time. And then we would get one of those pictures like I, I drew before, where time is one direction. And then, um, so Goodman gets around that by a trick. He says, well, actually, what I'm going to put in here is not enduring objects, but like little temporal pieces of objects. This is a way of thinking that comes naturally to certain philosophers and not usually to other people, right? That a thing can be divided into its temporal pieces <laughs> um, or its temporal parts, right? That like, if here's me when I'm in a baby and then this direction is time, and here's me now. Uh, 
um, that, you know, um, I can divide this kind of long thing into pieces. One part is like me between, you know, a certain time last year and a certain time two years ago or whatever. That's one of my temporal parts. <laughs> so like what's going to go in here are the small temporal parts. Um, I think it's less confusing, although it's still it's also confusing this way. It's probably less confusing just to forget that there's time and just think that like we only have one go. Certain objects are are under suitable pressure, certain objects are not, and that's the end of the story. Anyway, so inside this circle is supposed to be the objects or temporal parts of objects that are under suitable pressure. This is the extension of the concept or propositional function C. All the things that give you a true sentence when you plug them into C. And C says, is under suitable pressure. So that means all the things that are under suitable pressure are inside this circle. And then he says, well, take this predicate is flexing. Call this QM. So, um, Oh, I see what I have to do. Right. And then he says we can define another predicate. Call it, I'll call it QM bar. Um, and I'm going to define QM bar to mean is under suitable pressure and is not bending. All right. Um, so, and he calls this um, fails to flex, or I would say is failing to flex. I know that's a little bit off the side, but I hope you can flip off the bottom, but I hope you can still understand what it means. So, um, right, so this, this is is flexing. Let me erase some of this crap here. Let me erase this. So this says X is flexing at T, and this says X is failing to flex at T. And so he says, notice something interesting. First of all, um, everything inside this circle is either flexing or failing to flex. Right? You, it's, that's, it's obvious that that's the case because um, given the way these two things are defined, for everything inside the circle, this part is true. And of course, for everything in general, this either has to be true or false. That is, or that is either this has to be true or this has to be true. Right? That's the law of excluded middle. So, right? Either the thing is bending 
or it's not family. There's nothing in between. So for everything inside the circle, um, it's either you know in the circle and bending or in the circle and not bending. So we can divide the circle into the extension of QM and the extension of QM bar. And inside the circle, QM is a good definition for flexible, and QM bar is a good definition for inflexible. Right? As long as we only look at things that are under suitable pressure, then the ones that are bending, these are the things that are under suitable pressure and bending, those are the same as the things that are flexible. The ones that are under suitable pressure and not bending are the ones that are inflexible. So inside the circle, flexing is the same as being flexible. And failing to flex is the same as being inflexible. The problem, though, is, of course, and you know, this is the whole issue, that we want to say things are flexible or inflexible even when they're not under suitable pressure. So, um, Will QM and QM bar help with that? That is, is flexing and is flailing, failing to flex? They won't because outside the circle, nothing is either QM or QM bar, right? Because outside the circle, this conjunct is false. If one of the conjuncts is false, the whole thing is false. Or to put it again in a simpler way, Outside the circle is the things that are not under suitable pressure. Is flexing means is under suitable pressure and is bending. Fit is failing to flex means is under suitable pressure and is not bending. So the things out here, they're not under suitable pressure. Therefore, they're neither flexing nor failing to flex. So flexing and failing to flex divide all the things that are under suitable pressure into two mutually exclusive groups, but neither of them apply to anything that's not under suitable pressure. So Goodman says the problem of defining flexible in terms of manifest properties is the problem of projecting this line out of the circle. Right? We want everything, whether it's in the circle or not, to be either flexible or inflexible. Now, I think you know this may be one point where the, the vagueness thing gets confusing, where people could be led astray by it. When I say we want everything outside the circle to be either flexible or inflexible, the issue, the, the problem isn't that we're not sure which side of the line to put various things on. Right? The truth is we're, you know, in most cases, pretty much as sure for these things as we are for these things. And in both cases, we're not entirely sure, and it depends on context. Right, so the, the vagueness is not the problem. The problem is that outside the circle so far, we have no guidance as to how to draw the line at all. I mean, Again, obviously, we do know how to draw the line because we know how to use the word flexible. But we're trying to rationally reconstruct that. We're trying to explain what it is we know or what it is at least we could know in principle that gives us the right to make that distinction. And so far, we don't have any ideas for that. So it's, we don't know where to put the line at all 
not that the line is a little bit fuzzy or something, or that where you draw the line depends on, you know, the context. We don't know how to draw the line at all, but, the, but nevertheless, Goodman says it may be helpful to, even though at this stage he's not really suggesting exactly how to, well, he does make one suggestion, which I'll talk about in a second, but it may be helpful to think of our problem this way. We have a line within the bounds of the things where the conditions hold, the conditions of the disposition, Every disposition has conditions like this, right? Flexible means is bending, or it's flexible means, um, you know, if it's under suitable pressure, it will bend. Is how we would normally say this, I think, in English. <laughs> um, 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 flammable means, you know, if it's lit, it will burn. Um, conduct electricity means if a voltage difference is applied across the two ends, current will flow from one to the other, etc. So there's always conditions if it's blah, blah, blah. And he's saying our problem of defining dispositional terms and um, of eliminating in favor of manifest terms is a problem of projecting the line that we know how to draw where the conditions hold into the rest of the logical space where the conditions don't hold. And he gives a suggestion of how to do that, which um, is both a little weird and but that I think doesn't the weirdness doesn't bother Goodman, but also it's it's kind of unhelpful and that does bother Goodman. But so the suggestion is just this: we should find some manifest predicate that um, that we know how to apply everywhere, right? And he calls it A. So let's say we already know how to divide all objects up into the ones that are, I, I mean, actually, of course, since we always know how to do this, and QM is not, well, okay, never mind. I'm not gonna get a bit confusing tangent with the math. So we already know how to divide all objects into the ones that are A and ones that are not A. So that is a, is, a is a manifest property that everything has either has or it doesn't. I guess the right way to say this. Every property is a property that everything either has or it doesn't. But A is a manifest property, so we can tell if everything has it or not. Um, if we find that A always goes along with QM inside the circle, and not A always goes along with QM bar inside the circle, then we can define flexible as A. So it's weird, right? So in other words, like, suppose the only thing that ever bent under suitable pressure was rubber. Then we could use is rubber as A. Well, at least assuming is rubber is a manifest predicate. Can you tell just by looking at or just by sensing some, somehow that something is rubber? I'm just going to assume that for the, because, you know, it doesn't really matter for explaining how this works. Assume that is rubber is a manifest predicate. So we know how to tell whether everything in the world is rubber or not. In some sense, it's acceptable. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so suppose we, 
you notice that rubber is the only thing that ever bends under suitable pressure. I don't know how to imagine this world. I guess our muscles would have to be made of rubber, but I don't know. Anyway, so um, um, then, uh, and on the other hand, you notice that rubber always bends under suitable pressure. So inside the circle, everything that is flexing, that is, is under suitable pressure and bending is rubber. And everything that is failing to flex, that is, is under suitable pressure and is not bending, is not rubber. So inside the circle, the distinction between A and not A exactly tracks the distinction between is flexing and is failing to flex. And Goodman's suggestion is, if we can find a manifest predicate like that, A, we just use it to define the dispositional predicate. And you can see that at least the case I was giving, it actually, even though it's kind of weird, it gives a reasonable result, right? I, I find, if I find that the only things that are ever flexing, that is the only things that are ever bending under suitable pressure are rubber, and that every piece of rubber that's ever under suitable pressure is, 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 um, flexing, so everything that's not rubber and is under suitable pressure is failing to flex. No, I got that wrong. But anyway, uh, if I find that everything that is rubber and is under suitable pressure is flex flexing, and everything that's not rubber and is under suitable pressure is failing to flex, then the suggestion is I define flexible, is flexible to mean is rubber. And that's pretty good. I mean, you know, I mean, isn't that in that world, wouldn't we say rubber is the only flexible thing? So that's the suggestion. The reason it's weird is because, like I said, it doesn't seem like that's rubber is what we meant by flexible. But it's not supposed to be that kind of definition. That's why it doesn't bother. Goodman, it's supposed to preserve logical meaning. But the reason it's unhelpful is that he doesn't give us any, and he says, well, I don't know any general instructions for finding a predicate A like this. Okay, I'm over time. Sorry about that. I keep doing it. Um, and I will see you next week, at, at which time at least uh, I will be in person if everything goes according to plan. Okay, see you then. Bye. Oh, someone, Christopher asks, is A a class of objects? A is a concept, a propositional function. You give it the name of any object, and it gives you a true or false proposition. So an example is could be, is rubber. Its extension is a class of objects. Okay, I hope that was clear. Bye.